Jamie just produced a report on Real Vision about it's kind of his deep dive on where he thinks this cycle ends, the kind of valuations he sees, where the opportunities lie. And I thought, you know what? This should not just be for pro crypto people. This should be for everyone. I think it's a really important piece. And I love his framework. And it's going to give you something to better understand how to invest in this space and capture that opportunity from $2 trillion to $100 trillion. So I'm going to talk to Jamie. We're going to go through his research. You're going to understand a lot more about this space, where the opportunities lie, where this is going for this cycle, how to think about it. Bitcoin is set to explode with a potential price of $234,000 as early as August 2025 and a massive $100 trillion market by 2026. That's the latest prediction out from Real Vision heads Raul Pal and Jamie Kautz. Bitcoin is on a clear upward trend and when we look at its growth since 2013, it's easy to see the potential for even bigger gains ahead. In a recent discussion with Raul Pal, chief crypto analyst Jamie Kautz shared his latest forecast regarding Bitcoin's growth potential. From his analysis, he was able to calculate several price predictions for Bitcoin, inferred from current global liquidity trend, past market cycles, and Bitcoin's performance during each period. With this data, Kautz forecasts that Bitcoin could skyrocket to $234,000 by August 2025. Make sure to stick around until the end of the video as Jamie Kautz breaks down his analysis and reveals the possible outcomes for Bitcoin's price and performance in this site. Also guys, only a small percentage of my viewers are actually subscribed. If you enjoy staying up to date with finance content, consider subscribing or liking the video. It's free and you can always change your mind now. Here's Jamie Kautz with his latest Bitcoin analysis. Yeah, the most explainable is just to look at the linear growth of the Bitcoin chart from sort of 2013. And this chart you can see cuts off down the bottom left-hand corner um, just so you can sort of fit things in. But it's really that um, linear chart from the 2012 period. So you cut out those first really two years, which were just, you know, I, I don't think liquidity and, you know, where Bitcoin was traded has a lot of meaning towards the, the forward projection of the trend. If you look at that linear growth, um, you can see that um, the potential for Bitcoin to reach certain levels this cycle. So my base case is if we just look at global M2 and back it out to August, which was where the Bitcoin cycle peaks, that infers a price of about 100,000 on Bitcoin, um, which I am I'm placing as a, um, a potential outcome, but a very low probability outcome. My proportionality forecast is 170,000. That was the one that I uh, that I produced last year um, when Bitcoin is more or less in, still in a bear market. And then you've got these more optimistic scenarios where maybe Bitcoin gets back just to the mean, the red line of the linear price chart, which would imply a price of around 234,000. And then something crazy, you know, where it goes absolutely parabolic and maybe up to one standard deviation. So that's the range of outcomes. The question is like, what probabilities do you assign to each of those potential outcomes to come up with some sort of grounded um, probability weighted um, projection? And so, as I mentioned, global M2 regression line of 100,000 um, is sort of like my base case or worst case. And then all I've done is I've looked at these other potential outcomes and assigned a, a probability. I don't think Bitcoin is going to go parabolic to 500,000 this cycle. I see 500,000 in the future, not this cycle. So it's a very low probability. And the the outcome is just this probability weighted market forecast of 189,000 for Bitcoin um, by August of next year, which will give it a market cap of around 3.75 trillion. Um, seems, you know, for those uninitiated, um, seems crazy perhaps, but all I've done is taken, you know, previous trends and also regress it against global liquidity, which is at this point, probably one of the safest bets, right? In terms of what that particular macro liquidity variable will do, and then form a basis of where I think the, um, the cycle will end and also um, get to. My view is that I just had this very simple sort of outlook for the Bitcoin price as being sort of... Um, proportional in nature. It's exponential, but it is actually starting to immoderate in terms of the cycle. And so I applied just a, I think what was a very common sense sort of proportionality sort of discount, looking at the previous cycles, which are these blue bars that you can see here. These are the returns from the trough to the peak in the previous cycles. And then the, the next three bars in different colors are sort of the projections based on, you know, the, the proportionality of the trough to peak move for this cycle. And so my base case was actually the bullish, um, the bullish, uh, projection of about 170,000, which half the trough to peak return of the previous cycle. And 
I still use this in, in the modeling in the report because um, number one, I want to keep myself, you know, I want to be accountable to what I've said in the past. But I, I believe that this, you know, is just a, a very common sense approach. And then we sort of go into more sort of um, statistical ways of looking at it. So then I sort of think about, OK, well, we understand that global liquidity drives asset prices. What is the what is the, the, the correlation or the how much do these different metrics explain the Bitcoin price? Bitcoin dominance is well over 50% today. What what Bitcoin does, so does the rest of the market. So you have to sort of start there and then back out from there about the um, other sectors or the other assets in the in the space. But it, you look across these different sort of um, macro indicators or liquidity indicators, global M2 in the far right um, has generally been the strongest predictor or um, exp- explanatory variable for Bitcoin. So from there, I uh, then looked at, okay, if global M2 explains about 70 to 80% of the Bitcoin price, what will global M2 do in this cycle if we look at what it has done in the past? So just looking at the way you can can track the trough to peak moves in Bitcoin, you can do that in global M2. And I wanted to understand generally, how much does global M2 expand and contract? And how long are those expansions and contraction periods? And so that provided me with just some general averages that I could apply in my modeling for the crypto cycle. And so what I found was that generally M2 will expand by about 34%. People take the contractions are a lot shorter because we're, as you know, debt must always expand in a credit-based system. So we have these small contractions, shallow contractions, and we have these longer, larger expansion periods. It tends to correlate to the four years. So if you look at the number of days, contraction is roughly around sort of nine to 10 months. Expansions are around three years, three and change. So yeah, so you've got your three seasons in the expansion period and that the winter is your contraction. Um, So based on that, if you look down at the bottom of the table, it just says that, you know, global M2 could peak out at about 127 trillion this cycle. And based on the duration of previous cycles, it should top out at some point, maybe in, in Q1 2026, specifically, you know, January, according to the according to the um, model. And then we'll have, um, you know, we'll have the, the crypto winter, as you call it, sort of trough out or bottom out in Q3, Q4 of 2026. And so, again, this is just that projection on the time series of um, global money supply. But then we have to sort of consider what does Bitcoin do in relation to global money supply? And if you just overlay the two time series, Bitcoin peaks before global money supply peaks. Bitcoin sniffs out the change in global monetary conditions very, very well. At least it has in the past and I hope it continues to do so. And generally that's just because if you look at the rate of change of global M2, a slowing rate of change, it could still be positive, it could still be going up. But as soon as that starts to moderate, Bitcoin understands, or people trading Bitcoin because of its properties understand that, that actually that the end is nigh. And so we, if we look at the actual time it takes generally for Bitcoin or the, the period it usually um, peaks before the global M2 peak, it's roughly 160 days um, based on previous cycles. It's been as um, narrow as 116 days and as long as 222 days. And in terms of the troughs, they, they generally trough around the same time. So if you sort of back out from January, the global M2 peak, projected peak, you kind of get this Bitcoin peak that looks to be around. One of the most interesting aspects of Kautz's analysis is the relationship between Bitcoin and global liquidity. He explains that global M2 has been one of the strongest predictors of Bitcoin's price movements, explaining around 70 to 80% of its fluctuations. Examining historical trends, Coots concludes that during periods of expansion, global M2 tends to increase by approximately 34%. In contrast, contractions in liquidity are generally shorter and less severe, aligning with his observations of Bitcoin's cyclical nature. Looking forward, Coots projects that global M2 could peak at around $127 trillion by early 2026. He believes Bitcoin typically peaks before global liquidity peaks, an early indicator of changes in monetary conditions. This leads him to estimate that Bitcoin's price peak may occur around August 2026, ahead of the expected peak in global M2 liquidity. Do you agree with this projection? Let us know in the comments. Now, let's go back to Jamie Kautz as he explains. When people look at 
uh, Bitcoin dominance, typically what they're doing is they're going to trading view and they're looking at the Bitcoin dominance chart, which is like a default chart. So the Bitcoin dominance that I'm referring to is slightly different because I'm using Bitcoin dominance within the top 200. So the one you see on trading view, I think it's around 59%. In my top 200, Bitcoin dominance is around 63% currently. So it's slightly higher in the top 200. It takes up a larger share. Um, so I see a drop now in, in in the Bitcoin dominance that I use. It tends to get as high as 70 and as low as 40 um, from the previous two cycles. So that's kind of like the range. So 53 is pretty much in the middle. I don't think this cycle Bitcoin actually, Bitcoin dominance drops as much as it has in previous cycles. Um, I made mention of this in the, in the report and I talked about it in a report back from April about the increasing use of Bitcoin as collateral. I think Bitcoin moneyness is increasing with every new use case of it underpinning as a collateral for something else. So what have we seen that have been really positive developments um, in this regard this year? We're seeing the the creation of um, a st you know staking protocols on the Bitcoin blockchain, which allow Bitcoin holders to stake their Bitcoin for in other proof of stake networks without it leaving the base chain. Um, so while some people will want to do absolutely nothing with their Bitcoin because it's their the pristine collateral for their life and they can't afford any, they can't afford to risk it in any way, shape or form other than just hold it with a private keys, multi-sig or whatever and not do anything with it, there's going to be a percentage of that $1.3 trillion market cap value they're going to say hey i do want some yield and they're going to seek that out in a couple of different and then you've got sailor who's doing it um you know in a sort of less transparent way with large banking intermediaries by the sound of it um jp morgan i think you mentioned so if that's a yeah so there, i mean how much how much bitcoin does he i've no idea anymore you know it's about one percent so maybe it's a hundred and i i i don't know but so i always had in my mind there's probably like ten percent of Bitcoin holders. So that's unlocking $130 billion in value to underpin or form collateral for other things, including namely proof of stake now with the blockchain economy. So that's one, um, but obviously you've got the potential for nation states as well. Um, and I've been of the view that this will be the year that that becomes a reality. Um, it, it doesn't look like it's going to come a reality in, in 2024, but I have this suspicion that several countries are holding Bitcoin as of today, namely through their domestic mining operation. Whether they ever bring that to full light in a public forum, especially if you're a BRICS country or some country that's sort of sitting in between the two the, the, the two world blocks at the moment, you don't want to sort of make that known. Or even if you're inside one of these blocks like the Western block, it's just not um, it's just not convenient for you to be going around talking about holding Bitcoin because it is um, controversial. I think that's starting in a very, very small, in a very small way. And so you've got that, you've got the nation state level, which is, you know, nascent, but potentially starting. You definitely got it happening within the crypto economy. Bitcoin is going to collateralize proof of stake blockchain. And then you've got the individual themselves where in this cycle, I mean, I see them in Australia. There's a couple of companies who are doing lending against Bitcoin um, for the purposes of um, either private loans, but also mortgage, um, uh, home loans, um, which I see an increasing use case for given the unaffordability of property that people have this huge um, Bitcoin stack and maybe not much else. And they need that to need to actually um, find utility for that to, to buy property. So I just think that actually that's my that's my thesis as to why Bitcoin dominance doesn't go down to the depths that it has in the previous cycle. And from that assumption, which obviously could be wrong, you can sort of work out back out what the rest of the um, rest of the asset class could be worth in this scenario where you know Bitcoin peaks in sort of August. Meanwhile, Skybridge Capital founder Anthony Scaramucci predicts that the US Federal Reserve will allow inflation to rise higher than it has in the past to manage the country's looming debt crisis. As a result, he forecasts that Bitcoin's price will surge with an expected target of $170,000 by mid-2026. This would bring Bitcoin's market capitalization to around $3.3 trillion, driven by its fixed limited supply and growing demand. Scaramucci's outlook on Bitcoin is further supported by a surge in institutional interest in Bitcoin exchange-traded funds. The entry of these ETFs into the market has provided a huge boost to Bitcoin's visibility and accessibility to mainstream investors. BlackRock's Bitcoin ETF in particular has seen remarkable growth with $872 million in net inflows, the fund's largest influx since its launch earlier this year. According to BTC Markets crypto analyst, Rachel Lucas, 
The recent surge in BlackRock's IBIT inflows is driven by several key factors, including central banks' global shift towards reducing interest rates, which has boosted liquidity and made capital more accessible for investors. As these trends continue, it's clear that both Bitcoin and the crypto market in general are set for massive growth in the near future. Anyway guys, before we go, if you want to stay most up to date on the crypto and Bitcoin world, make sure to subscribe to my daily 5-minute crypto newsletter. It's a concise resource for the latest expert predictions, breaking news, and top on-chain analysis, trusted by over 50,000 subscribers for insightful crypto investment information. Don't miss out on the opportunity to stay informed in the crypto market. The link is in the description below. I hope you all enjoyed today's video and that it provided you with some value. I'll see you all in the next one, and as always, all the best.